If you have a Bible this morning, and I hope you do, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, as we examine one verse this morning, verse 14, Hebrews chapter 4. We'll read starting in verse 11, but then we'll focus on verse 14. And once you have your place, if you're able, if you're willing, please stand for the reading of God's word. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 11. It says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sword of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Amen. You can be seated. Let's pray. Father, we are here today only because of your grace. Lord, we know that we, as those who were fallen in Adam, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, that we are not deserving of being in your presence. There is nothing in us that makes you draw us into your presence. There is nothing in us that forces your hand and saving us and redeeming us and justifying us or sanctifying us or bringing us to glory. But it is all of your grace. Our very existence as human beings is of your grace as those who are born in Adam, who have forfeited any right of heavenly life with you forever. So we praise you this morning, Lord, for your grace that has drawn us to this place atop Mount Zion where we have gathered to enter into your holy place and to worship you as the one triune God who has made all things. The triune God who has redeemed a people through Christ the mediator. And the triune God who has promised to make a new heavens and new earth where we will live with you forever. It is all of grace and we praise you for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and meet us this morning as your people. We pray, Jesus, that you would walk amongst this lampstand, that you would tend it as our high priest, that you would pour the oil of your spirit in this place so that it is set ablaze in worship and passion in our hearts for you, our covenant God, the God to whom we are bound even as a marriage. So come now and speak to your people. Give us hope and encouragement. Convict us and draw us to yourself. We might be with you forever, now and in the new creation. pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Well, commenting on the transition from Hebrews 4, 11 through 13 into verse 14, Martin Luther, who is the great reformer, he says, after terrifying us, Verses 11 through 13. The apostle now comforts us. Verse 14. He goes on to say, after pouring wine into our wound. In verses 11 through 13. He now pours oil in. In verse 14. And why? Why does Martin Luther say this? Well, if you were here last week, or you listened to the sermon online at least... You will know and you might remember that verse 11 is an exhortation. And it is an exhortation to enter the rest of God. And it is a warning against not entering into the eternal Sabbath rest of God. And not entering the rest ends in falling in this wilderness world and perishing. So verse 11 is an exhortation, and it's a kind of double-edged exhortation and threat. 
And if we can put it in simplest terms, it's an exhortation calling us to embrace Christ and all that he is and offers, all by faith, a true and living faith, so we might inherit eternal life with God, which is Sabbath rest, which is what we were made for. And that is so crucial to see. It is what we were made for. It is the essence of our faith and our religion. It is the essence of the covenant that we belong to. But at the same time, he ends in that verse, verse 11, by warning us against perishing in this wilderness world apart from Christ and in unbelief. And then in verse 12 and verse 13, in the context, he teaches us in these two verses that God knows and sees into the depths of our heart. He sees into the deepest parts of our hearts. And his word lays bare in this age, and God from heaven sees, as the omnipresent and omniscient God, whether our hearts are bringing forth faith or faithlessness. Belief or unbelief. He commands us to enter his rest and he warns us against dying in the wilderness. And he essentially says in verses 12 and 13 that there is no escape. You will enter rest or you will perish. And so therefore by the word, God lays our hearts bare. And every time the word of God is read or preached, he sees through his word deep into our soul. And God himself sees through everything that we put in place to guard our hearts so that nothing we put in place as people in this world can block him from seeing into the depths of our heart. This is why Jesus in the opening of Revelation has eyes like fire, eyes like burning fire, the omniscient Christ whose eyes burn up everything in their path burning up everything that might keep him from seeing into the depths of our hearts. The point is, nothing can keep this omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God from seeing into our hearts. And it is to this God that we must give an account and thus enter into rest or perish. And so therefore, Verses 11 through 13 give us two options, and that's it. We enter by faith into Sabbath rest, and we live by faith with our eyes on the eschatological goal, which is eternal life with God and the new creation in resurrected bodies, or we perish and end up in the lake of fire with bodies fit for suffering forever. Or to put it the way Jesus does, there is a narrow path that leads to life and eternal Sabbath rest. And according to Jesus, few will find it. But there is a wide road that leads to destruction, which is the path of many. Sabbath rest or dying in the wilderness. The narrow road which few find, or the wide road that leads to destruction, which many find, and there is no escape. Because God sees into the depths of our heart. And so therefore, Luther calls this a terrifying warning. And it is. Luther calls it wine in our wounds. And why? Because it stings. It hurts, and it's scary, and it's especially scary for those who are on the edge of the wilderness contemplating the promised land. Those who are on the fence, so they think. And so it is a terrifying warning, because we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and there are no exceptions at all. But then, Luther says, after pouring wine into our wounds and terrifying us, an exhortation warning, the writer of Hebrews goes on to encourage and strengthen and comfort those saints who are entering rest. Sabbath rest by faith in Christ. 
And that's in verse 14, which is our text today. So as we look at this verse, here's what I want to do. Mainly two things. First, I want us to see the structure of the verse, which is so crucial if we're going to understand what he's actually saying. I want us to see that we have an exhortation, and then I want us to see the reason or the grounds for that exhortation. That's part one. And then in part two, after seeing the structure of the verse and the exhortation itself, I want us to see why he exhorts us. Why he is telling us to do what he is telling us to do. So that we see the glorious grounds of this encouraging exhortation. So if you have your Bibles, notice in verse 14, if you have the ESV anyways, that verse 14 starts with the phrase, since then. Or we could say, therefore, which is what the Greek is. And that's actually what the NIV has. Or we could even say, because. Meaning that the writer of Hebrews is giving us now at the opening of verse 14, the reason for his exhortation, which comes in the second half of the verse. So the opening is not the exhortation. The opening is the reason for the exhortation, and the second half of the verse is the exhortation. So if you want to break it up, you could say 14a is the reason, and 14b is the exhortation, starting with let us, in the second half of the verse. And here's the way the argument works, or here's what it means, or here's the structure. I'm going to paraphrase it. It goes like this. Because we have a great high priest, a mega arch priest, who has passed into or through the heavens, namely Jesus, who is a man, the Son of God, who is God, because that is true, since it is being a fact, therefore, hold fast. Let us hold fast our confession, our profession, our faith, all that we believe. That's the structure and the substance of the grounds and the exhortation. Or, if you want to reverse it, switch it around so that you get the exhortation first and then the ground second, it would go like this. Let us cling to our confession. Let us hold fast to all that we believe as Christians. Let us hold fast to our faith confidently and unwaveringly. Why? Because Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is our great high priest, he has passed through and into the heavens. That's the argument. That's what verse 14 is teaching us, and that's the structure we have the grounds first, and we have the exhortation second. And so therefore, in this verse, the exhortation, the command, the horatory subjunctive, is simply this. Hold fast. Hold on. Take hold of and do not let go. Grasp with an unrelenting grip. That's the exhortation. That's the command. And what are we holding on to? All that we believe. It's my opinion that our confession or our profession, depending on how you translate it, is a summary. It's just a summary word for our faith. For all that we believe as Christians. All that we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, we are to hold on to that and hold fast. And so if we understand that this holding fast is ultimately a kind of endurance, um, then that's what it is. It is an endurance, it is a running the race, it is a holding on and if we see that, if we understand that, then we begin to see how this verse commanding us to hold fast is connected to the previous section about entering rest. Even though translators kindly break it up with a nice bold heading. But here's how it connects. We know all that's not there in the original, right? 
All those bold headings and titles are not there. And so sometimes you have to read through them as if they don't exist because they can actually screw up your Bible reading because you read to that point and you think, oh, they're done. I'll start the next place tomorrow when the next verse broken up by a bold heading is connected to what you read before. So how is it connected? Well, here's how. Those who believe back in chapter 4, enter the rest that's been held out. And not just those who believe, but those who continue to believe. Those who hold fast to their confession, those are the ones who enter the rest. And so he's not doing something different here. He's simply going on in verse 14 by saying the rest that I've been holding out to you in Hebrews 3 and 4, the very rest that you enter by faith, that same rest, that same faith, hold fast and don't let go. The whole thing is driving forward. Why? Because it's not just those who professed at one time who enter the rest. It is those who have believed and are believing and will believe Insert for soil parable. Do you know how many people in this nation call themselves Christians because they believed at one time and they put their name on a card and they think that they're going to inherit eternal life and eternal Sabbath rest and eternal covenant union and fellowship with God because they profess to believe in Christ one time? They're all going to hell. Every single one of them, if they are not still believing. Jesus tells us that those who endure, who hold fast to the end, will be saved. And so therefore, we don't need to be exhorted one time to believe, and then we call it a day, but we need to be exhorted every day as long as today is called today. That's the whole point. We must exhort one another. That's back in 3.13. And here he is exhorting us to endure. Why? Well, because if you haven't figured it out, life in the lower register is hard. That's why. Life in the lower register is brutal. It is painful. And sometimes it is unbearably miserable in such a way that you do not want to hold fast. You just want to give up. And so therefore he comes along and he says, hold fast. The lower register, this life and this world, is miserable. And anybody who's lived long enough knows it. It is a life that is filled with pain and suffering. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 1 8, this is life in the lower register. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction. The suffering that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. And often do we not feel like the preacher in Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes 4.2 And I thought the dead who were already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. Do you ever feel like that? Paul did. To depart and be with Christ is far better. To live as Christ, to die is gain. 
And so therefore, the writer of Hebrews, fully aware of this by the Spirit, is exhorting us to hold fast in this world. He's exhorting a people who are suffering. They're being thrown in prison. Their properties are being plundered. They're being persecuted by their fellow countrymen. That shows up later in the book. But in general terms, the Christian life and the life of God's people from the start of sin has been a life of suffering and pain, a life of internal struggle and pain, and a life of external struggle and pain. Dealing with our own sin and the discipline that comes from our good Father in heaven who disciplines his sons, Hebrews 12, which is painful and hard. Dealing with our enemies and the enemies of God who make our lives utterly miserable sometimes, sometimes in our own families or even our own church. And the point is life is hard and therefore the wilderness is dangerous. There are wild beasts and there are lions prowling around. It's dry, it's hot, it's unbearable sometimes. And here's the thing, I know that we think we're better, and I know that sometimes we mock Israel in the wilderness because of their stubbornness, and because they groan and they complain, and they, they hate what's going on. But if we can be honest, we are absolutely no different. And in many cases, we actually understand. They groaned in the, the wilderness, and they complained in the wilderness of being more miserable there with God than they did in Egypt without him. Now he was there, omnipresence, of course. But their seeing of the theophonic glory, his covenant presence, it was not there the way it was through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And the point was, they were willing to go back to Egypt, where life was hard, and where they were slaves, and yet it felt easier than being in the wilderness with their covenant God who rescued them. And therefore, because the wilderness is so brutal and hot and dry and dangerous, and because so many fall and perish in the wilderness without actually entering rest, he exhorts us, to hold fast. And it's not just here, but it's all over in the Bible, church. Sam has been showing us week after week in the book of Revelation these calls for endurance and holding fast, clinging to Christ. Revelation 2.10, it says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days, that's this whole life, for 10 days you will have tribulation. What's the call? What's the exhortation? Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That's the call. It's a call for endurance, holding fast, being faithful unto death in the wilderness for 10 days. 10 days of suffering. Or Revelation 13, 10. If anyone is to be taken captive, to, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. And that's what we're seeing in Hebrews 4.14. To hold fast is to endure. It is to not let go of our Christian faith and all that it is, 
centered around Christ, no matter what. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, young son, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And why does mature, militant Paul Tell his young son this? Because life is war. Therefore, fight the good fight. You will not make it into Sabbath rest without fighting. You won't. You will die in the wilderness. And then later, Paul tells Timothy, the last section that we have from Paul, as far as I know, before he died. 2 Timothy 4, 5 through 8, he says, As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, clear-headed, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry for for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. I am dying for the Lord, Timothy. And the time of my departure has come. And what does he say? Remember what I told you, Timothy, about fighting? About fighting the good fight of the faith, enduring? I have fought the good fight, young Timothy. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The point is, Paul held fast. Paul endured to the end. And Paul knew that if he had fought the good fight and finished the race, there was a crown of righteousness for him that would be placed on his head when he enters the heavenly kingdom. In Revelation 20, where he sits down and reigns with Christ. So in summary of that exhortation, the writer of Hebrews is exhorting us, commanding us to hold on. To cling to our confession, all that we believe as Christians, because this world is a wilderness, and the wilderness is dangerous, and it is painful, and it hurts. And what is the ground for this exhortation? If that is the building, what is the foundation upon which this building stands? What is our confidence? Why should we hold fast? What is the evidence that there is any kind of, of reward? Well, what is the steel that gives, that gives shape to our spine? What is the ballast? In the bottom of our storm-tossed boats? The answer is the first part of verse 14. Let us hold fast because we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who has already passed through or into the heavens. That is the ground. That is the root and foundation for our hope and endurance. What does this mean? Why is it the ground of our endurance and holding fast? Well, God has given us a beautiful illustration of what this actually means for Jesus to pass through the heavens 
in the Old Testament. And specifically in everything regarding the tabernacle and the priesthood. But to even understand the tabernacle and the priesthood, you have to go back to Genesis. And specifically, I think, Genesis 1 one. So let me start there and let me show you why Jesus, Jesus entering the heavens is the grounds for our endurance. Well, if you go back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says that God creates the heavens and the earth. And when we think about the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in my opinion at least, the heavens is not the sun and the moon and the stars and where those realities dwell. But the heavens are the invisible heavens where God dwells in the fullness of his unapproachable light and glory, surrounded by the angels who worship him. That is the heavenly, invisible, glorious kingdom of God. As seen in Isaiah 6 and other places. And then the earth is the land and the sky and space. Created in six days. And that's the earth. Formed starting in verse 2. Not the invisible heavens. And so therefore from Genesis 1, 1 and on. There is an invisible realm. Called the heavens. Where the glory of God is in its most saturated or potent covenant fullness. God himself says, heaven is my throne. So there is an invisible realm where God dwells with his angels and all the saints who have gone before. But then there is a visible realm that declares and reflects this glory. A copy. Namely, all that is visible, where the visible image bearers of God were created to dwell in covenant with the God of heaven. And this is precisely, I think, the wall, the, the way Paul understands Genesis 1-1. If you look at Colossians 1, 15 and 16, look at what he says. He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. Now watch what Paul does here. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That's a chiasm. Heaven, that's A. Earth, that's B. Visible, that's B prime. Earth and visible are the same. Invisible A prime, that is heaven. Meaning that in Genesis 1, 1 and on, there are two realms. There is an invisible heavenly realm which we cannot see. And there is a visible earthly realm that we do see. And we live in this realm. And from that point, there has been an eschatological goal. There has been a telos, an aim, a goal of God... And that final, ultimate aim and telos was to bring this invisible realm where the glory of presence, the glory presence of God is, and the visible realm together as one. This is why God enters into covenant with Adam. The covenant is the path to bring about this goal. And if Adam had executed the covenant of works, once he was done filling the earth with image bearers, kingdom building, and all of that stuff, then the unapproachable glory light of the immortal God would break forth from heaven and fill the visible earth as if the earth was one great big holy of holies. That's the goal of the covenant. Or another way to put it is this way. The eschatological goal for man was to dwell in a heavenized world face to face forever with the triune God in fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. And therefore, unlike the Lutherans and unlike other groups, we as Reformed see Eden not as the goal, but as the starting point. 
Eden was a glorious starting point where Adam, as an image bearer of God, made in righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. He had fellowship with God, but he had not yet experienced the final, consummate reality. And because of sin, and in accordance with the predetermined plan of God, the eschatological goal did not and has not yet come into existence. And so therefore, all throughout the Bible, you have this division between the heavens, the highest heavens where God dwells in unapproachable glory light and the visible realm where man is. And they are still distinct and they are still separate. And so therefore, all throughout the scriptures, there is still an eschatological telos that brings the invisible and the visible together as one. And therefore, because that is true, God would never let his people lose sight of that goal. Never. And if you understand that, that heaven and earth union, that is the ultimate goal, where mankind dwells with the creator God forever and the fullness of his presence, then you understand why the tabernacle comes into being. What was the tabernacle? It was a microcosm of heaven and earth, heaven and earth, a microcosm of the distinction and the veil between heaven and earth that has existed since Genesis 1-1. And God gave Israel this tabernacle as a reminder of the eschatological goal. That God and man would dwell together forever. And therefore, the holy of holies in this tabernacle that is a microcosm of heaven and earth. It represents on earth in the tabernacle heaven. It is a model of the invisible, upper invisible register that we call heaven where the glory presence of God is. And so the ark represents his throne, guarded by cherubim. We see those pictures in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 and 5. And once a year on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, which is at the center of the Pentateuch, literally, the mountaintop, on that day and in that chapter in the middle of the Pentateuch, the high priest, would cover himself in glorious garments, setting him apart as a new kind of Adam figure, representing all of God's people. And he would, on the Day of Atonement, once a year, enter into this Holy of Holies behind the veil, into the earthly copy of heaven itself. And what is the message? The message being held out, which was the message from the beginning, is that man and God together in heaven, on earth, in the same play, in the same place, would dwell together forever as a result of atonement, all of which is brought about by a federal priestly head. Now, there's a whole lot more to be said here. And if you want to read up on this, I recommend a book by Michael Morales on biblical theology of Leviticus. But the point is this, is that from the beginning, the goal has been God and mankind together forever in heavenly glory, in a heavenized world where there is no longer a veil that separates heaven and earth. 
And thus the tabernacle and the priesthood and the veil itself keep this hope and this promise alive that one day God's people will go through the veil into the heavenly realm where his presence is. And we know this because every year the high priest would enter the most holy place, a picture of heaven. And the writer of Hebrews is taking all of this imagery and all of Israel's Old Covenant, Old Testament history and scripture. And he is teaching us most simply that Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, he is the greater great high priest who comes fulfilling and bringing about all of these glorious realities, not in the typological shadow picture form, but he is the great high priest because he brings about the actual reality to which all of those things simply point Jesus, the man who is the son of God, making him the God man, has passed not through an earthly veil from the holy place into the holy of holies, but he has passed through the veil that separates heaven and earth, which is the true holy of all. He is the one who has eternally dwelt with the Father, the second person of the triune Godhead. In the fullness of time, he descends heavenly Zion. He is conceived by the Spirit in the womb of his mother. He takes on flesh. He is born under the law, perfectly obeying for our righteousness. And then he is offered up as a sacrifice once and for all for the sins of his people. The sacrifice to which all of the Old Testament sacrifices pointed. And after his finished work, and after being raised from the dead bodily, he is the great high priest who has passed not into a heavenly copy on earth, but he has passed through the veil into the heavens. The highest heavens. The invisible heavens now dwelling in the most holy place, heaven, as our head and as our representative. And he has promised to bring us to where he is, and that is our confidence. Amen. This is why you should read Leviticus. The entire point of his argument is bound up in Leviticus. The design and creation of the tabernacle in the second part of Exodus and the way that man can dwell with God in Leviticus. And we'll see this later as we, as we come to the end of Hebrews where he tells us that everything that Moses saw all of the command regarding the tabernacle was a copy of the heavenly reality that is unseen. And the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is that Jesus is the substance and that he has entered and he has passed through the highest heavens where God is. And that is the rock under our feet. That is what helps us to endure and to hold fast our confession. Not fallible, fickle religious experience or feeling that comes and goes, but the rock under our feet is an actual, historical, immutable fact. A work of God in history as recorded and interpreted in Scripture. Christ, the resurrected and glorified last Adam, who is a true man and truly God, with a true glorified body, glorified reasonable soul. He is in the glory presence of God. 
He is in the unapproachable glory light of the immutable, immutable and immortal God. And that, here's the key, that is what we were made for. That is what Adam was made for. What Christ is seeing and experiencing. Where he is. That is the eschatological goal of our existence as image bearers. And he stands there now in heaven at the right hand of God with our names. Written across his chest on his breastplate, representing us, his lowly and needy, exhausted, sinful people who live in this lower register. And where he is, where he is as our head and our representative. And our great high priest, who has done all that must be done and has accomplished all that we never could, because of this, where he is, there too we will be. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. Are you in the presence of God this morning? Already not yet. Not in the way that you will be. This is what Hebrews 2.10 calls bringing many sons to glory. And therefore that is the foundation for our hope and endurance. And so therefore look to Christ. See him alive living for our righteousness in the Gospels. See him on the cross, bearing the curse of sin and death on our behalf. See him in the tomb, dead under the power of death. See him raised by the Father through the Spirit and see the risen Christ ascending into the heavens and finally out of sight, Acts 1. And then see him now. See him now. Standing before his father as the lion-like lamb who was slain on our behalf. Knowing that if we are united to him by faith, we will be with him where he is in heavenly glory. And Christ himself will see to it. Jesus himself prays like this in John 17. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. This is how your high priest prays for you. And do you think the father is going to tell the son at his right hand? No. That is our hope. That is our rock. That is our strength for endurance. Where Christ is, we will be, and he will see to it. He will bring us into heavenly Sabbath rest, and we can be absolutely sure because he, as the archigon, the captain, has already gone before us in glorified flesh. He has entered into this most holy realm, the kingdom of heaven, the realm of the glory presence of God, and he will remain there, reigning for a thousand years, welcoming his people who die in his name, that they might rest from their labor until he comes again to judge the living and the dead and to bring into existence the heavenized world, the new heavens and earth where God and his people will dwell together forever, basking in his heavenly unveiled glory presence 
forever and ever. And that was the goal from the beginning. So as we close, church, let me exhort us, in line with the writer of Hebrews, to be more heavenly minded. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says. Our inheritance is in heaven, Peter says. And the kingdom is in its fullness in heaven. And therefore, because of that, may we live as pilgrims and as exiles here, longing for our heavenly homeland where our Lord Jesus is. Hebrews 11 about Abraham says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. But by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And of all of the saints in Hebrews 11, it says this, But as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for securing this heavenly Sabbath rest for us in and through your dear and only beloved Son, Christ. Lord, help us to endure in this world, in this wilderness. Help us to hold fast because life is hard. The life is filled with suffering, and misery, and pain, and glimmers of, of joy and pleasure. But help us to endure knowing that we, we are pilgrims and exiles here. That this world as it is is not our homeland. But we belong with you wherever you are in heaven and in the heavenized world forever and ever. So give us strength, give us endurance, help us to hold fast. For this all in Jesus' name and all God's people say.